Okay, great. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, super excited to be introducing the team from Current today. Their website is currentwater.org. Um, Elena Harkness is the executive director. Elena leads Current's work to build collaborations that advance innovative solutions to water challenges. She most recently served as managing director for the economic development firm RW Ventures, where she helped launch and lead the New Growth Innovation Network and helped develop inclusive growth strategies for cities and metropolitan regions. Prior, she held a research fellowship in urban governance at the Brookings Institution, led urban development strategy for the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and staffed civic collaborat collabor collaboratives, the Partnership for New Communities and the 2016 Fund for Chicago Neighborhoods. Elena is a non-resident fellow in the Global Cities Program at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and has published research and commentary for the Brookings Institution, the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank, and City Lab. She holds a BA in political science and art history from the University of Rochester and a master's degree in public policy and Latin American studies from the University of Chicago. And she's joined today by Kalindi Parikh, a program builder from her team. So welcome to you both. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Courtney. Um, and so excited to jump into um, why water matters for startups and what startups can be thinking about right now with relation to water innovation. Great. Well, we're really excited to talk about that. Um, at Current, we really have three main jobs. Like we're a water innovation hub headquartered in Chicago. So water is what we do. And we are a nonprofit organization that launched in 2016 to do three things, grow the blue economy, drive innovation in water and solve persistent water challenges. And in that work, we are partnering all the time with startups like you um, and large corporate actors, uh, research institutions, all sorts of folks that are helping to really drive water solutions forward. So we are really excited to come and talk about ESG and why it matters for us and why it should matter for you. So why are we here? I'm gonna give you just a few minutes on a little bit about why current needs to exist, but it's also an introduction to why all of you are hopefully in the room today. Uh, there's some shared challenges we all have, and then there's also, I think, a shared vision for what we can all do to help solve water together. So current exists because everybody can agree we all need more healthy water to drink and less flood water in our basements. Those are two things that really affect us here in the Chicago region, but these things play out in, in countries and cities all over the world. Current also exists because we're trying to help use water unle to unleash opportunity. We want blue jobs that create opportunities for people to work in water, creating innovative companies like yours that are solving water challenges or whatever problem it is that you've been created to solve. So our job is to be a catalyst and to help support all of this, uh, create more opportunity as we solve water challenges. So water, it is a global challenge that comes to ground in our backyard. All of us feel this differently. So wherever you're located, I guarantee you've got some sort of water challenge on your doorstep. Water scarcity is already affecting people on every single continent. By 2025, two thirds of the world's population could face water shortages. So just let that settle. It's not mostly our problem here in Chicago where Kalindi and I are based um, because we're fortunate to be on the shores of a great lake, um, but it's still, it's actually a problem for people even within the city of Chicago where, uh, you know, lead service lines affect the quality of drinking water that people have access to, affordability continues to be an issue, but just baseline access to water, huge problem affecting a lot of the world. Climate change. Climate shifts are changing the way that water lands on the planet. It means washed away beaches, more erosion, flooding, more polluted water that reaches and contaminates our drinking water. So all of us are feeling this every day. And water quality, I already mentioned lead, but there's other kinds of water contaminants that some of them are really on the radar, like microplastics. Others you may have never heard of, like PFAS, which are forever chemicals that we use in uh, a number of different ways to do things that are productive, like make firefighting foam that is very effective, but also leads to toxic contaminants uh, that leach into the groundwater and can be very, very challenging uh, for communities, for people. So all of these are ways that water pressure creates risks and uncertainty for you, for me, for the planet, and for the businesses that we are trying to run. So what will it take to do something about this? Current was started because we believe that generally people aren't rallying fast enough behind the kinds of innovation that we need to drive change in water, to protect our health, to protect the environment. So it's this drive for more urgent change that really was Current's kind of founding impetus. So 
we work on issues that are too big or too complicated for any one company or organization or utility to do by themselves. We think solving water often requires collaboration and that takes a fit for purpose entity whose job is to do the hard work of getting people to work together and build partnerships. Uh, everybody trying to work together to try to de-risk the work of building innovation in water. So Current's answer to that, we try to advocate for the best water solutions and policies. We're looking all the time for what new water technologies are out there and trying to figure out how to bring them to market. Uh, we are more than a connector though. We actually do test technologies in the real world, which is a really fun part of the job and the work that we do. Um, this is one of our interns doing water quality testing in the Chicago River. Uh, and we are always looking out for what kinds of technologies we could be testing. So we're working on things like sewage surveillance, which is using wastewater to actually detect outbreaks of viral, uh, viral outbreaks like COVID-19 before we're able to sort of feel symptomatic. That's a really exciting frontier. Um, eliminate, finding and eliminating PFAS, as I mentioned, these forever chemicals, um, and also you know, looking for ways to identify and eliminate uh, lead and other sources of contamination in drinking water. So we do this by creating community, by building platforms and driving strategies. And uh, one of those that we're working on is a big uh, blue economy strategy for our region. So anchored by Chicago, but Illinois and, and broadly with our um, collaborators up in Wisconsin. And that's really a blueprint for using water to drive economic growth and innovation in our region. We're working on uh, employment strategies and education, ways to sort of reach into the population to make sure everyone gets as excited about water as we are and uses that as a uh, entry point for a career exploration into many different uh, ways of working in water as, as innovators. Um, and we also do events and convenings, obviously participating with partners like 500 startups and educational opportunities like this, but also during our own events like Chicago Water Week, which is a big uh, fall occasion for us. So that's a little bit about Current and what we do. We're not alone and we're not sort of unique in being a, a hub that's dedicated to building collaboration among a lot of partners. So I wanted to show this slide just so you have a sort of sense of where we fall and, and uh, also get a sense of some of the other players that are out there, the other innovation hubs. Um, innovation hubs have been around for, I don't know, going on 15 years now. Uh, TMA Blue Tech was one of the first out in San Diego. Uh, the Water Council, our neighbors up in Milwaukee launched in 2009. Current was launched in 2016, as I said, so we're a little bit later to the game. But along the way, all of these hubs have been formed because their locations, the cities where they're founded, saw huge economic opportunity in water, huge economic potential for growth and really big opportunity for innovation. So that's why, who we are and why we do what we do. But why do you need to care? So we know all of you are not necessarily working in water. Um, you're out building other businesses that are solving other problems for customers. And that's great. But as you all know, as just people in the world, water is rising on the geopolitical agenda. The entire world has said, you know, we've got sustainable development goals that we're working towards by 2030. All the ones here and many others touch on water. Um, it's, you know, really integrally related to building sustainable cities and communities. Um, then there's the ones that actually call out water, like six and 14, uh, climate action, everything that the world's doing on climate. A lot of that comes back to water, as I will explain a little bit later. Um, but that's all, this is the sort of global, you can think about this as a sustainability agenda, um, sort of a social good agenda, but you're a business. So you're not a water company. You may not even be a heavy water user. Why does water matter to you? So I wanna argue that it matters for a number of different reasons and all of them relate to the business bottom line. So first of all, water creates a lot of risk for your business, even if you're not a water business. Um, and the three main ways I'm drawing heavily here on a McKinsey ESG report that sort of does really great framing on this, uh, the three, and also uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project, which is the UK-based organization, um, CDP, formerly Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, that is actually responsible for helping to sort of benchmark standards for uh, corporate and uh, the world's progress on, on climate goals. Um, operational, this is like not having enough clean, affordable water when and where you need it to do your work. Uh, regulatory. This is current and future laws and regulations that might affect the ability and price of water. A lot of uncertainty there. Uh, reputational risk. This, you all know, this is your, your brand impact. This is how a business uses and manages water and what that means to you. So I want to go a little bit deeper into these, each one of these uh, operational risks. So just so you get a sense for the order of magnitude here, in 2020 alone, 
the 8,000 suppliers that were disclosing their work through CDP reported 1.26 trillion in revenue is at risk over the next five years due to climate change, deforestation, and water insecurity. That's trillion, that's a big number. Um, major buyers in the US could see $120 billion raise in costs over the next years because of these environmental risks in their supply chain. This is gonna look really different across different industries. So um, this is a map uh, also uh, from CDP that shows a little bit of the um, projected cost, the financial impact of water risk and the cost of responding to that risk per sector. So you can see there's heavy water users on here like manufacturing, like power generation, back to that idea that really water and energy are very related. Um, so food, beverage, and agriculture. You can see that you know some of these industries are going to have water more heavily embedded in the supply chain than others. Uh, but really, across the board, even for more surprising industries that you might not think of, uh, biotech, healthcare, and pharma, quite a lot of water uh, risk involved as well. So regulatory risk, I mentioned, you know, the the world's, uh, the way the world sort of prices and regulates water uh, globally, it fluctuates locally, but I think this point is that it's fluctuating, it's changing, um, and there is a lot of, you know, risk involved in fines and penalties and enforcement actions. Some of this is just the traditional way of thinking about, uh, you know, needing to be a good uh, environmental steward, um, but you could also miss out on opportunities uh, for subsidized and government support because we are thinking about how uh, you know governments invest in cleaner water futures. So lots of regulatory risk builds in here, and then also this is the gut check where I see if you're paying attention because we throw Taylor Swift in, but it's reputational risk, right? And reputational risk we often think of as like not making a bad headline in water in some way because you've become a major polluter or something else. But it's also, you know, it's the reputational risk associated with the money coming down the line. 68 trillion that could change hands to younger generations in the next 25 years. Many of you may have heard about this kind of intergenerational wealth transfer that's coming. And the generation that's going to be empowered to invest, think about the environment as a way, or think about investments rather as a way to express their social, environmental and political values. Um, this, source that says 71% of millennials would turn down an investment opportunity if it was in a company with negative environmental and social effects is a really powerful number. So we want to think about uh, how to turn that risk into upside for your business. So the flip side of this is there's a lot of opportunity to uh, attract revenue, attract investment, and also just improve your business bottom line if you think about uh, water as built into your business and where water appears. So the investor opportunity um, Green Biz found that two thirds of 800 institutional investors that they surveyed said water factored into their investment decisions. So if, if it's the third behind cybersecurity and anti-corruption as a top ESG consideration, that's pretty big. And here's a spectrum of investor water priorities. They range from disclosure to you know, more communications efforts to pr promote positive water impact. But the bottom line is that investors are starting to take notice about what companies do with water and how they care about it, whether or not they're explicitly a water company on the surface. Some of the biggies, BlackRock uh, you know, famously said climate risk is investment risk, uh, and that they would specifically start to vote against management and board directors when companies aren't making progress on sustainability disclosures and the business practices that underlie them. So again, water, a very large factor there. Um, Morgan Stanley's pledge to prevent plastic waste. Again, you may not think of this as a water-related goal directly, but obviously a lot of water, a lot of plastic waste comes from you know, liquids we consume, bottled water is a major contributor. Um, so again, ways that water gets sort of hidden uh, in some of these objectives are really important to tease out. So, Again, drawing on McKinsey, um, really helpful kind of backup to say ESG in general, why should we care, and then map it to water. So benefits of having a good ESG strategy, top line growth, right? So attract more B2B and B2C customers with more sustainable products. That's, that's a great opportunity. Cost reductions. Uh, lowering your water use means lowering energy consumption. Reducing your water intake uh, could reduce costs. Reducing the regulatory and legal intervention, right? That's really, you know, staying on the right side of the law with, an, uh, with respect to the way that you use your water. Um, productivity uplift, that's attracting and retaining talent through greater social credibility. That's, you know, keeping your employees happy, your workforce happy, um, and then advancing, enhancing your investment returns by figuring out how to better allocate capital, um, taking into account these future risks in water. So 
boiling all of that down, there's all these hidden risks and hidden opportunities. And the corporate world has really increasingly started to simplify this framework as ESG, right? Environment, social, and governance metrics. And I want to share how I think water actually applies across the board to each of them. Obviously, environment, where we start, is maybe one of the more obvious places, right? So goal of environment, strategy within ESG, optimize water and energy use, figure out how to reduce the costs and risks of using water, and figure out how to anticipate what's coming down the pipe tomorrow. So even more specifically, create water conservation goals, right? You can figure out ways to reduce water use in big and small ways, as well as indirectly map them through uh, your supply chain. You can identify hidden water costs and risk. This is not always straightforward to do, but more and more companies are starting to do it. Uh, and there are blueprints you can follow. Vet your suppliers and partners against their water practices. So as you grow, even if you're a startup now, you are hopefully gonna have very large purchasing power in the future, right? So ask your suppliers and partners, even as uh, you're starting to grow, what are their water practices? Um, because that's market force that you can exert there as well. And then finally, location. Locating your offices in water and energy efficient buildings, that's another way that you can exercise choice and show your water values uh, in the decisions that you make about where to have your business. So just a little bit more detail on why water and energy uh, go so hand in hand. So this graphic depicts what um, people shorthand as the water energy nexus. It just basically means that all water takes energy to produce. So it takes energy to clean water, it takes energy to deliver water. Everything about getting clean water to you in your home and sending it away to be cleaned and treated takes a lot of energy. And uh, by the same uh, token, there's a lot of water that is used in the production of energy. So this cycle means that basically anybody talk, anytime anyone talks about decarbonization or achieving our climate goals, reducing our energy footprint, that has a ton to do with water. And we don't always lead with that. We don't always say that right up front, um, but it's really important to keep that in the back of your mind because I think the, the conversation around energy and climate and decarbonization is a lot farther ahead of where the conversation is about water and the pricing is also uh, kind of ahead, right? So we're thinking about ways to value decarbonization efforts and all that, but often water's pretty hidden in those efforts and you can start to call it out separately. Water footprint. Here, this is, you've all, I'm sure, seen some version of this where it shows how much water is used to make common consumer products. Uh, you can think about this with your business too. How much water is involved with the cost of, you know, a ream of, of paper, the technology that you buy. There's all sorts of ways that you can think about unpacking your water footprint. And this is a group called the Virtual Water Project that came up with this, uh, this graphic here. Um, and you can think about doing something similar for your business. There's also some interesting big corporate examples of how, uh, how they're building water in to save bottom line, right? To actually save money, create efficiency. So this one comes out of a partnership between Kraft Heinz and Alco Water. They launched a water recycling project. So obviously this is a big consumer products company that uses, they're what we would call a heavy water user. They use a lot of water in their business. And as a result of this kind of innovation partnership and a new uh, air flotation, dissolved air, dissolved oxygen flotation system that they put into practice, they ended up saving 86 million gallons of water a year at a single plant. That is a great, Water, store, water conservation story, but it also saved them a bunch of money, annual net cost reduction of $500,000, which is not, not small change. Another example, HP, um, again, linked back to this idea that Morgan Stanley is trying to reduce, you know, plastic is their sort of top line metric. Um, 700,000 pounds of ocean bound plastic were used in HP products since 2016. That's them mapping their footprint. They were able to decrease their water footprint 11% in 2019. Um, and that was all about indirect consumption with HP product use and decreasing water consumption across their supply chain. So that move earned them an A-list rating from CDP. That was something um, important for them to do. And again, CDP uh, as one of the major disclosure organizations or the major disclosure organization, uh, it's an important stamp of approval. Adobe, another in the tech space, um, leveraging existing software products. So they're quantifying how many transactions they're able to, like through paperless transactions on Adobe Sign, how much water that saves. So that's quantifying in water terms, just the normal cost of what, of business, of the business that they're in, of what they're doing. And their goal is 60% water 
reduction in 10 years. And finally, an example right here from home in Chicago um, that is itself a startup. It's a Chicago-based circular economy startup. And it has a resource management and exchange program that's actually helping other organizations to do some of this work, visualizing their assets and trying to be an underpinning for the circular economy. So really helping clients save money, but also reduce energy and water impact and their footprint by uh, reducing the number of new supplies and reducing waste that they buy. So they've got a reuse network that they're um, supporting. So I think that's a really interesting example of a, a startup, but one that's like directly involved in uh, benefiting from the space and the need to reduce water. So that's the E, moving over to the S. So the goal of the social in ESG is really thinking about how we can use water to improve relationships in your workforce, improve the quality of life of your staff and the communities you operate in. So some small ideas about how you could think about water to achieve your, your S goals in ESG. Team building. So, so many cities are located near big bodies of water, lakes, oceans, rivers. Water's a big motivator. People love to spend time on the water, near the water. There's tons of ways that you can do team building activities and use water as a you know, convening force, getting, getting people to come together to do something productive. Employee health programs. So making sure that you're, do all your employees have access to water? Are you providing um, clean drinking water and you know, recycled bottles? Are there ways that you can think about how to bring water into your health programs so that you know, you're supporting um, the goal of all of your employees having access to it? And then giving back and getting involved with local water hubs and nonprofits. There are some in every city, I guarantee you wherever you are, there are groups that are working on water issues and they're really great and meaningful ways to get engaged. And again, showing how water matters to your business, even if you're not water on the surface, um, is a great way to show that you're being thoughtful about that. So here's a couple of photos. This is our friends at Friends of the Chicago River. They lead waterfront action days, river cleanup days uh, in Chicago throughout the year. This is our team doing water quality monitoring, which we work with interns and volunteers to support. So lots of ways people are happy on the water. They love to get out on the water. It's a great way to help fulfill the S part of ESG. And finally, the G, governance, everybody's favorite. Um, this is infusing water expertise into all of your decision-making from internal policies and strategy development to your board of directors, managers, the way you interact with your shareholders and stakeholders. So this is a really important and I think often overlooked part of ESG strategies and the way water can matter. You can think about how you recruit sustainability and water expertise into your board, into your governance structure. Prioritize that. Have people on call that you can ask about your supply chain mapping, that you can call on to help you understand how to reduce water impact in your business. You can embed water metrics into your business planning and your impact measurement. And you can figure out how to track and communicate that impact and talk about all the work you've been doing up in the ESG, ES spaces of ESG as well. So what is next? So we wanted to leave you, I know this is a lot to think about um, with the framework, but we wanted to leave you with a little bit of a sense that there's some really low hanging fruit and ways that you could just walk out of this presentation and start. So on the E side, you can just start to resource, research your suppliers, water sources and their practices. This is really thinking about where's water in the work that you do and how can you figure out ways to improve the way that you exercise your market power, your buying power to support better choices? On the S side, plan a water-related volunteer team building activity. The world is opening up. It's a great summertime uh, plan to get out there and do something on the water. Uh, this is a great way to sort of build morale on the team and just help people learn more about the water resources that are right in your backyard, right in your neighborhood. And on the G side, think about how you build water experience and water expertise into your board pipeline. Like maybe it's not today, but down the road, think about how you build this in, dedicate a board seat to a sustainability and water expert. Plenty of ways to start on that. But I love this uh, WWF's water stewardship steps. Um, you know, think about how you take your startup on the journey from water awareness all the way up to this, you know, stewardship goal of being an influencer, being able to be, you know, exercising the kind of market power that some of these large corporates are to be able to drive better decision-making in water. So I'm gonna leave it there and uh, take questions if there are any and keep talking with Courtney if, and Kalindi if not. So thanks so much for the chance to talk about this. Great, thank you, Elena. And I do wanna remind everyone that a recording of this webinar will be shared on our website and uh, the 500 Startups YouTube channel. Um, but if we could just go back to that previous slide, the what's yeah. next slide. 
You bet. One quick question. Uh, number two, the knowledge of impact. Could you elaborate on on that one and what it means for a business? Yeah, so I think I think the, I'm looking back now on my slides. Um, so partly I think it's this, right? It's understanding the risk side of the equation. And that's where like really getting into the sort of supply chain mapping and understanding like, where is water for you? What's the risk side and what's the opportunity side? What's the upside? Where's the chance to sort of, you know, use better water decision-making to drive growth in your business? And where are the ways where you need to cut out the risk? So um, that's that's part of what it means to me. Uh, hang on, backing up, backing up. Um, but it could also mean that's that's the business answer, right? It can also mean awareness of what it means to the world, right? So familiarizing yourself with like what are the global goals? What do we mean when the world says goal six, clean water and sanitation? For who, by when? Right? Same thing with life below water. What does that mean? What are we talking about? The health of aquatic communities. Each one of these goals, this is the you know, sustainable development goal agenda, each one of them has pages and dozens of hundreds of partners that are all working to try to achieve the specific vision that's laid out for each of these goals by 2030. So it's truly a global blueprint and trying to familiar, familiarize yourself with that, unpacking which parts of that you could help contribute towards, I think that's also part of the answer. Great, thanks. Um, so you, you touched on um, vetting suppliers for their water sustainability practices. So when you're speaking with suppliers, what, what should we be asking about? Um, what are kind of the key words that would signal uh, they value water sustainability and that that's built into the culture? Yeah, so first I would just ask about their disclosures if they have a water footprint, like just very simply, um, do you have a water footprint? Do you know how much water is in your supply chain? Like just putting the question to them that you would pose to yourself, the same kinds of questions. Do you know where water is? Um, do you know uh, what, are, what are some of the um, efforts that you're putting in place to try to reduce water use, reduce water consumption? Do you have targets around reducing the water use in your business? Um, so I, I think it's in like the general answer to that would be ask them the same hard questions you'd be asking yourself. But if you can familiarize yourself, again, back to this, uh, very helpful chart that's showing like if you are you're looking at a manufacturing supplier, you're going to have some more specific questions, right, than if maybe if you're talking to an apparel company, which, you know, in terms of overall, you know, relative amount of water used. Um, now, I mean, in the apparel industry, there's a lot of water that's used in the production of their raw materials too. So, but again, you might want to have specific questions and around each of these areas, there um, is starting to be more and more written about where water appears in each of these respective supply chains. But general answer would be, ask them the same hard questions you're asking yourselves, but make them harder because you're spending <laughs> money on them. Yeah. Well, that's helpful. And then kind of in the same vein, um, when, you're, when you're vetting water sustainability experts or even environmental sustainability experts for uh, it, board advisory roles, um, what types of questions might you suggest asking someone um, to, to understand their depth of, of knowledge specific to water? Um, you know, like how might you broach that conversation? Yeah, well, it's interesting because I don't know that it always, if you think about whether or not you need to have someone with expertise in water or have they, have they ever like led a, you know, a, d a development of an ESG strategy for another company that's related to you. Because if they have, maybe ask how they thought about water as part of a broader portfolio. Water is related, again, as I said, to energy, to so many other uh, facets of the broader sort of sustainability play. So yeah, I mean, I would be just as eager to talk to somebody that had led a, a major energy project um, and to talk to them about, you know, well, how, how would this apply? Like, how do you think about water that's built into that? So it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, you've got somebody just for water, but I would ask the people that are, you know, your experts on energy, how they think about water, how they think about that relationship and try to unpack that. I mean, energy and decarbonization is going to continue to be this major driving force and it should be it has to be right we're not going to achieve our climate reduction goals without it uh, but you can start to unpack as part of that as part of your energy savings goals as part of your decarbonization goals um, start to talk about uh, what that bottom line means for water and you know how that complements some of the other things that i think sound you know it's like you know we know we've moved beyond turn off the lights as a way to think about decarbonization 
and it's the same like we've moved beyond maybe uh like not leaving your faucet dripping and swapping out shower heads but also like those things are still really important those like little consumer things that we do every day that when you add up uh matter to how we're using the scarce water resource that we have um but there's also these like bigger things and i think the the bigger thing conversations around water a lot of them are really linked to energy um so thinking about thinking about that and talking about that um really important yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I think just making um, space for water, like you said, in your sustainability portfolio, yep. and kind of formalizing in conversation and then in writing that this is something we care about, and we're committed to making a dent in. Right. Um, but I like that you touched on that it's there's no place that's too small to start, especially for early stage companies. Right. And just opening up the conversation with the team um, is a good starting place and then starting to research. Yeah. Um, I also think, you know, generally we encourage early stage startups to be speaking with investors and potential investors and potential enterprise customers about these efforts, no matter how small, um, and sharing that these are values of the company and this is what we're doing and committed to focusing on. That's right. And I think, you know, in the way that now I think everybody's expected to have some thought about the way that you know what your energy footprint is what your you know carbon footprint is um getting ahead of that on water i i, I do believe that that's going to change and we will start to expect it on water as well we're not there yet i mean it's not something that everyone's demanding those kinds of disclosures um but it's going to be changing quickly and being on the right side of that on the leading edge of that uh, will be a better place to be i think than than lagging to catch up yep and earlier in you talk in your talk you had mentioned there's some blueprints out there for developing water conservation goals. Are there any specific ones that you have in mind or websites where you might refer people who are feeling ready to begin that research or, or write out, formalize some of these goals? Yeah, so we've mentioned, um, I'll go back to a couple. So again, the like the McKinsey ESG strategy was a really interesting, like if you're looking for just a good reference point on like, how do you think about ESG? How do you sort of, um, what are what are the building blocks? And we've referred to some of that here. Um, this one I think is also interesting. The, this is called the Virtual Water Project again, and just thinking about like starting to map out what are some of the big raw materials that you use in your work, and if it's like technology, how do we value that? Like, what's the water footprint there? Um, so, Virtual Water Project uh, CDP probably has some of the most robust. That uh, that's uh, the UK-based charity that runs this global system for investors, for companies, everybody to kind of manage environmental footprint. Um, so they have some of the best, I think, up to date standards on looking at how to do environmental reporting. And that's kind of how you come back into creating a strategy. But I don't know, Kalindi, you also did so much of the, um, the research and helped kind of sift through a lot of really interesting material for this. So any other big ones I'm missing that you want to call out? You know, I think the CDP one was like hands down the most useful when it comes to those really specific uh, indicators. They have, you know, they have different benchmarking resources related to, you know, deforestation and energy and water, and then also the sort of combination and they update them every year. So I, I definitely recommend that one. Yeah. The Water Council up in Milwaukee also just put out a report recently that maybe you can find and drop into the chat that was uh, kind of mapping out what water stewardship looks like. They run a, a water stewardship network of corporates in the Milwaukee region. And I think they'd also just published um, a pretty interesting report looking at um, how some of them are mapping. So that might be another good reference. Um, and some other, just since we have a little time, um, getting to know, like when we think about the blue economy and who's in and out, I didn't spend a ton of time on that, but if you kind of start to map who in your location um, are water leaders, like who, you know, not just nonprofits, but, you know, who are some of the companies that have leading strategies, right? So if you're in a field that's building technology for agriculture, who are the ag companies that are really doing leading work in this, right? So um, we were recently meeting with um, a, a very big ag company that's headquartered here in Illinois, and they have really talked about how to build, like, it's, it's part of their operations, like their, their ESG strategy, really to think about how water, what their water footprint is and, and how to help it, um, how to improve it. And so, you know, thinking about some of your aligned industries and some, who are some of your end users going to be? Like, who's your customer base? Who's leading in your field, right? Who are, what are some of their practices? Because then aligning with those ends up being a natural selling point as well. 
Yeah, I think this, um, especially for early stage companies, I think it's a natural fit with looking at your carbon footprint as well, which is really hard to evaluate in the early days, but you can start to quantify it. Um, and then making sure that your customers and suppliers and investors all know that you are looking at water and carbon footprint as part of your climate change reduction efforts. Um, just going to like sort of a higher level here, I'm curious, like what geographical hotspots are making the most progress with water conservation or innovation? Um, like where should we be looking and, and paying attention to? Yeah, um, so this, uh, again, CDP, um, these are the 88 cities that they have on the CDPA list. Um, so, you know, probably not complete, but uh, a lot of the leaders are on this list. And again, CDP would be a great um, place to go. But when we think about um, water leadership, I'm going to go back uh, to this slide with the innovation hubs because Let's see, the other innovation hubs like Current, um, yeah, so here's here's a bunch of really interesting work and you could go Water Council here, those are our friends up in Milwaukee. Um, Imagine H2O, this is uh, the leading national accelerator for water startups, so there's a lot of really interesting peer companies that are, all of them focused on, um, you know, startups that are building business in water, so that actually could be an interesting place to look for for partnerships, um, if you're kind of interested in helping peer companies and making, you know, making connections there, they've got an accelerator program that's putting out uh, a whole cohort of water innovators who are probably also thinking in really smart ways about how to communicate the value of what they're doing because it's their business to be reducing, you know, water footprint or improving water quality or whatever it is. So that's another suggestion would be to go go and talk to the Imagine H2O cohort. Um, some of these others, so Cleveland Water Alliance is uh, much like current, a Great Lakes based water innovation hub, uh, doing a lot of really interesting work with uh, their Lake Erie and, you know, surrounding ecosystem there. Um, Let's see others that, to call out here. Um, again, TMA Blue Tech in San Diego, they just put out a value of the sort of marine blue economy report. That's a really interesting resource, I think. And they have been uh, doing such leading edge work to like invest in the companies that are actually driving marine blue economy uh, out in San Diego. And so again, I think they have some really smart ways of talking about the bottom line impact and where the growth needs to come from. Um, Again, they're focused on blue economy, but there could be some really interesting partnership opportunities there as well. Um, so I would look to some of the places that have dedicated water leadership and then globally, there are the ones that um, sort of, we know Israel, uh, you know, countrywide, but in, in certain hotspots in Israel, a great center of water technology. Um, we have a lot of partnerships there. The Netherlands uh, is another, obviously they're some of the leaders in the world are thinking about how to deal with the impacts of climate change because um, they, are flooding a lot, so they've figured out ways to deal with that. Um, Singapore is another kind of hot spot for water technology innovation. Um, there are many others. We're just kind of calling out some of the peer places that we work with. Great. Well, thank you so much, Elena and Kalindi. It was great being here with you today. Um, we are out of time, but uh, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And as I mentioned, it will be on our website, uh, 500.co slash ESG in the near future. Great. Thanks so much. It was great to be with you. Good luck with your work. Thank you as well. Likewise. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.